Hiya and welcome. I am Sabrina and this is Every Seven Years, a podcast inspired by the fact that every seven years you essentially have a new body. And this body has been created by you, by your habits, your choices, your environment, your lifestyle. Like nature, you are constantly cycling and rebuilding. And just like a tree requires ample water and nutrients, fresh air and sunlight, you too require constant attention and proper care. But in today's society, we've become really distracted and very good at ignoring the cues our body shows us. But your sensitivity is a superpower. So if you are curious about how to become more of your favorite you, join me here every week for deep dives intended to inspire you to uncover the wisdom within us all so that you can live with more ease, confidence, and joy. Hello, my friends in self-healing. I hope you've all had a wonderful week. I am Sabrina, and I am back for a deep dive this week on cellulite. If you've listened to this podcast for a while, then you know it is all about the things that I have learned in my own self-transformation and healing journey in the last seven years to get to where I am now, as well as going through changes, currently learning things at the present moment and sharing them with you guys in an effort to help myself grow, in an effort to help myself let go of shame and fear and in an effort to help you guys do the same and maybe learn little things like I do with every podcast I listen to, everything I read, every book I pick up, anyone whose content that I tune into and I'm called to usually has a little message for me. And so my hope in doing every seven years and this podcast is that by sharing all of the random things, holistic, spiritual, Ayurvedic or otherwise. If something has helped me and transformed my life, I am on the podcast talking about it. And one of these things that I am currently learning about and researching in order to heal for myself actively at this present time is cellulite. On past episodes, you've heard me talk about self-concept work and healing emotionally and going through my body image journey of self-acceptance. And why I bring that up is because before I get really deep into today's deep dive, I want to disclaim this by saying that there is nothing wrong with cellulite. It does not make you ugly or weird. In fact, 80 to 90% of women after puberty have cellulite. It is so much more uncommon in men. Apparently, only 10% of the male population gets it. (sighs) But I digress. The point is, we almost all have it. However, I think it's interesting with things like this that we normalize them. I've always gotten my back up a little bit when we normalize feeling like shit as we age or looking like shit as we age. Because I think inside there's always been this little part of me that knows that that doesn't have to be inevitable. I've always understood since I was a kid that our choices and our lifestyle and the habits that we do and the environment that we're in and how we think about our life ends up creating our life and ends up creating our problems both externally and internally. And so as I've grown from someone who had adrenal fatigue syndrome and a Hashimoto's diagnosis and was super unhappy and suffering from an eating disorder at age 25 and 26, to being 33 years old, loving myself and accepting myself, I have had to go through a shift of viewing my symptoms as a gift. For me, Healing my cellulite and going on this journey is out of love and devotion and respect for my body. And it is not because I hate it and want to change it. However, I think there's nothing wrong with wanting to change it because here's the real truth. And this is why I started this podcast. We change every day. Cells turn over and renew all the time. Our skin cells are a matter of weeks before developing new ones and completely replacing the skin that we have now. 
And so as I've learned that our bodies renew and really it is all of our choices and environments and the interactions we have that either help them generate and turn over in healthy ways or in dysfunctional ways, I have learned that a lot of symptoms are really just signals that our body is sending us of dysfunction. Symptoms are our body communicating with us with signals in a way that it thinks that we will be able to understand and interpret. And our body is right to send these signals to us because we can interpret these things. We can understand them. I do believe that we have symptoms and we either react to them by stuffing them down, by shaming ourselves for reacting to the symptom entirely, or by doing something about it, right? And for so long in my life, I ignored my symptoms or shamed myself for reacting to my symptoms. Case in point, when I had an eating disorder, it was really birthed a lot from this place of reacting to food poorly or rather reacting to non-food food. Having my very first super processed meals and feeling like absolute garbage. And instead of seeing that symptom of feeling like garbage and reacting to it with love and devotion and understanding and curiosity, I reacted with shame. I thought it's not normal to feel bad for eating like this. We celebrate this. There's commercials where people are eating KFC and laughing. Why is it that I feel bad about this? And then it was the added shame of why do I feel bad about feeling bad about this? Rather than listening to my symptom, leaning into it and seeing what it had to tell me. And so as I've gone through all my changes in life, I've really learned to love symptoms truly because they're signaling something to me in a way that my body hopes it can understand. Just like how my dog tells me little things without having a real voice, she tries to signal to me in various little ways things that are going on. I could gaslight her and ignore her, or I can try and understand what she's getting at. And cellulite for me is this little thing that I am leading into and listening to and going, what is wrong with you that you are here? What dysfunction is present that this is happening? Why is this the case? And another point I wanted to make before going on is that it may not be totally reversible. Genetics do play a role in the development and holding of cellulite. However, that doesn't mean that we can't possibly reverse and undo most of it, and maybe even all of it for all we know. Maybe we can actually have a better diet, lifestyle, and regime to heal cellulite so much that we can change the genetic expression of it and maybe eliminate it altogether for our family lineage. (laughs) But I just, love topics like this and exploring them with you guys from all different lenses, from scientific lenses, from the lens of doctors, and from holistic lenses through ancient perspectives, through Ayurveda. And according to Ayurveda, cellulite is a red flag of a toxic body. If you have cellulite, it is considered that there is an accumulation of heavy metals inside of your body. And as I looked into this and looked more into the science of it, I ran into Sam Miller, Sam Miller, a doctor, and he actually has a fantastic, super thorough technical podcast called Sam Miller Science. And he actually just put out an episode this past June 4th, all about cellulite. And so I listened to the whole thing and made a crap ton of notes. And then that sent me on a tailspin to Human Garage, which is another amazing resource on fascial health. I've mentioned them before in my episode on fascia and why instead of doing Botox and filler, you just need to heal your fascia. (laughs) And I also pulled into some resources that I have in naturopathic doctors who I follow on social media, such as April from The Primal Bod and Aggie, who talks all about cellulite and cortisol and how to hack your body. And so in loving and researching and listening to all of these people, I wanted to give you guys a deep dive today that is as quick and to the point as possible that breaks down what cellulite is, why it actually happens, some risk factors for developing cellulite, and what are the five main things that we can do to eliminate it or lessen it. And so this is research that I have done for myself because I plan on following this like a Bible for the next five months 
when I say Bible, like I do with my supplements, I forget every couple days. So I'm sure I will fall off here and there. But consistency is everything. And as we know, with habit evolution, one little win leads to many wins. So if I just try, if I have five opportunities with 50 sub points under each for little things that I could do or remember throughout the day to incorporate or not incorporate in order to heal my cellulite, that's what I'm going to do. And my plan is to document this journey for you guys. I will be doing regular podcast episode updates. I'm sure I'll mention it even in random podcasts at the beginning in the intros or maybe throughout if it's relevant. But I also want to share this journey on my Instagram. So if you aren't following me yet, make sure that you are at Sabrina Smelko because I will be posting really candid videos of my cellulite. And for me, it is all over my thighs and my butt cheeks. And I will be showing progress over the next five, six months using this regime to see if there's an improvement. And then we can just celebrate together on my 34th birthday in Mexico. <laughs> so let's just dive right into this episode by first learning what cellulite is and why it forms. Cellulite is essentially dysfunctional fascia, as I talked about in episode three on fascial health. So to break it down even deeper, cellulite requires two conditions in order to thrive. First, it needs the occurrence of enlarged fat cells. And how this happens, how this hypertrophy of our fat cells occurs, particularly in the thighs and glutes, is due to toxins. This was so shocking to me. What happens initially with cellulite is our fat cells become little sponges that absorb the toxins in our body from our diet, from our environment, etc. And our fat cells soak up these toxins so much that they become extremely enlarged. And after they become enlarged, the area around them then inflames and you get water retention around the enlarged fat cell. So you have an enlarged fat cell due to this sucking up of toxins in your body. Then you have fluid retention around all of these fat cells, but yet your body is the same size. So your skin, like a balloon and on your face, kind of is forced to dimple and crease and wrinkle, just like how a wrinkle would form on your face when there is restriction and adhesion and glueiness. And then due to this fluid retention, due to these enlarged fat cells, what basically happens, like I was saying, is it calcifies. It becomes stuck in that position and then changes essentially happen in the extracellular matrix of our collagen structure, aka our fascia. And that's what causes the appearance of cellulite. Quite simple, but it requires a couple little things to happen. And like many things with our health, it is not one singular thing that causes it. It requires a toxic environment. It requires inflammation. It requires then a series of hormonal shifts and changes. And it requires the absence of any kind of detoxification or massage, etc. So how do we become toxic? Why do we have all of these toxins? Where are they coming from that they get so big in our bodies that our fat cells have to absorb them in order for us to process them? Well, a lot of our toxic exposure comes from pesticides, comes from our air quality, comes from our water quality and our food. It is all of the things that we consume. It's the things we consume food-wise, beverage-wise, air and oxygen-wise, skin-wise, through the organ of skin with the products that we use. It is no surprise that in our extremely highly processed modern world where our food is not real food and has a bunch of chemicals in it, where we spray crops and outdoor spaces with pesticides, where our air quality because of living in cities, etc., is polluted. And then add on to that things like stress, things like hormonal imbalances. And when we think of toxicity, I think we also have to think of things like canned foods and heavy metals, potentially even certain vaccines that might have high amounts of heavy metals. These all contribute. So what other contribution factors there are, and I hinted at it earlier, is synthetic estrogen, birth control pills. People who have been on birth control 
especially women who may have been on birth control for a long time, might be more susceptible to developing cellulite. And let me tell you guys, not to brag, but I was on birth control for 17 years. Yeah, from age 14 till 30. Is that 16 years? That's a long time. And basically that screws up your hormones because your body is not being allowed to go through each of its cycles that a natural normal woman wants to go through. There are four. It keeps your body in one state. So your hormones like prolactin and estrogen and testosterone and progesterone get all bunked up. Being on synthetic estrogen also increases inflammation in your body and oxidative stress as well as increases your gut permeability. And this is kind of the fancy word for leaky gut. A lot of people know leaky gut these days. It's kind of all over the internet. Gut health is huge. Well, one of the biggest risk factors for developing leaky gut or gut permeability is synthetic estrogen and things like birth control. Other risk factors and causes are stress and cortisol. You've heard me talk before, I think it was episode five on healing high cortisol, all about this sneaky stress hormone that is necessary in the body, but that we overrun ourselves with and overproduce due to our lifestyle, due to high stress activities, due to hit training and getting on our phones right away and feeling like we have to work, work, work and do, do, do and accomplish so much in a day. Other risk factors that I saw specifically April mention a lot of is to do with insulin and sugar. If you have dysfunctional insulin levels, and you have really bad blood sugar and consume way too much sugar, you could also be at a higher risk factor for developing cellulite. And this all is really interesting to me because I think about people who are maybe even athletes and Human Garage mentioned this. They see people who have three, four percent body fat, very high impact athletes have cellulite. And what's interesting is these people might also have very high cortisol, high intensity lifestyles, and they might also not necessarily be eating well. A lot of these athletes who train like crazy eat a lot of sugar and carbs, and maybe their insulin is a little bit out of whack because they burn so many calories that they have that they feel like they can just eat whatever they want to compensate makes me think back to when I would do karate, probably burning like 2000 calories and then crushing banana cream pies. Yes, I was able to metabolize it calorically. It didn't accumulate on my body as fat, but who knows all of those years if eating all of the sugar that I was burning off because I was in a deficit, that's not to say that the quality of the food wasn't impacting me somewhere else. And maybe that's why I have cellulite right? It could be that I've had a high sugar, high intensity, high stress lifestyle and diet for a decade. Nearly all of my 20s, I probably drank too much wine, had way too much sugar and candy, relied far too much on carbs and far too little on protein and micronutrients. I never focused on fats and I was also on birth control pills. I was the perfect risk factor, living, walking, breathing risk factor for developing cellulite. And that's why I think I have it. And it's funny because these things take time, just like it takes seven years for our body to almost completely renew. And even then there are still things that take even longer. It's at least seven years. Things take time, right? So if cellulite maybe took seven years to develop or three years to develop, it might take seven years or three years to undo it. And so I have no doubt that it might take me until I'm in my 40s to undo some of the toxic load, some of the sugar, some of the things that I put myself through in my 20s. And I feel like I'm working those things out and shedding them every single day. And each time I make these better choices with all of this information in mind, I feel like that one cell that turned over today is like, yay, you did it yay, you did it. Instead of getting disappointed every day, I'm trying to listen to each little cell as it goes, hey, I got a little need and trying to respect what it wants and, and give it to that. But I digress. Other risk factors for developing cellulite are hyperthyroidism. 
this really shocked me. And once again, something that I was a dead ringer for, because as you know, if you are familiar with Hashimoto's, you are either hyperthyroid or hypothyroid at any given time during having that disease. And I believe that I was functioning mostly in the hyperthyroid state, maybe going into hypo for the later part of my 20s as I did learn to relax a little bit more. I think I did tend possibly to being a little more sluggish and that's when I also like put on weight, but I was also kind of intending to just let myself see the other side of things. Maybe I could kind of just be a little bit of a slob and a hermit and be inward for a little bit and see how that goes. And you know what? It benefited me. But now here I am trying to find the happy media. So those are the main risk factors. To go over them again, it is having a accumulation of toxins in your body. So think about your diet. Is it really highly processed foods? Think of your environment. Do you breathe good air? Think of your water. Are you getting toxins in that way? Think of the products you use. Is there anything in your home? Are there any fragrance diffusers or really bad chemical cleaners or dishwasher or soap or shampoo, whatever might be a toxic product that is getting put on your body or consumed by you, consider that a risk factor. Number two risk factor is, is being on synthetic estrogen like birth control, which leads to inflammation and oxidative stress. I'll kind of put those ones as number three. Another risk factor is gut permeability, which has a lot to do with those other factors already. Number five risk factor is stress and cortisol. Number six is going to be our insulin and our sugar, that diet, which is kind of related to that first point. And then lastly, having hyperthyroidism. So now that we know what cellulite is, now that we know why it happens, I want to go straight into as quickly as possible what we can do about it. Okay. This is going to be, like I said, my regime for the next five, six months as I lead up to my 34th birthday where we're going to Tulum and I'm going to be living in a bathing suit, squeezing my little butt cheeks all over that beach and really seeing if it's still as dimpled and cute as it is now. <laughs> so what can we do to cure our cellulite or reverse it? As I'm sure you will guess, number one is diet related. Not only do you want to eliminate all hyper palatable, extremely processed foods, anything pre-made, anything that has tons of ingredients on it that aren't single source ingredients like pineapple, coconut oil, banana. You know, if you can see a few of those, you can buy it. If it has a bunch of chemicals and ingredients that you don't know and dyes and dioxides and silica and preservatives and all of that shit, it's best not to eat it. Just eat whole foods. It's one of the hardest things to do if you've lived for a long time eating really palatable foods because the encouragement is really low. There's low motivation when something doesn't taste as well as you think, doesn't taste as good as you think your takeout will taste. But let me tell you, as you start to eat better, your taste buds do change and you will find the highly processed crap tastes like garbage and home cooking and single source ingredients are going to become more and more what you want to eat. So outside of obviously not eating crappy, highly processed foods, you do want to also watch your consumption of sugars. And that even goes for healthy sugars like honey or berries and fruit. If you are going to have sugars, make sure they are, like I just mentioned, those single source ingredients, but that you aren't having them totally alone. So for me, I love to have my fruit with my protein and fat. So in the form of a smoothie, old me would literally make my smoothie with fruit, a little bit of yogurt and a splash of orange juice. And it was like sorbet literally berry sorbet. Very yummy, super nutritious, but not something that you can count on as a meal to satiate you. That's probably going to end up spiking your insulin and your blood sugar more than it's going to benefit you. Think of our ancestors. They didn't have unlimited fruit all the time. They were definitely not eating fruit all day. They were only consuming fruit in the summer and they would probably gorge on it and then not have it again for months, if not a full year. So when I do consume my fruits, I try and put as many as possible into a serving packed with other stuff. Like I was saying, getting in a good healthy fat and protein. So putting it in a smoothie, putting my berries and my mango and whatever into a smoothie with some coconut oil or avocado with some chia seeds or a good protein powder 
with some good high fat coconut milk, not orange juice, using fruit juices should be a thing of the past, especially if you're on a cellulite healing journey like I am. And really just thinking about that sugar intake of yours. If you are going to snack, you know, like I am so guilty of grabbing Haribo, twin snakes or gold bears, things of that nature. Gummy candies and me have been best friends since I was a kid. And it's probably showing up on my thighs and butt in the form of these cute dimples, right? So for me, when I go to snack now, I'm going to go for more of the chips or obviously like a healthy alternative, but I eat so healthy all day. You guys that when I do have my night snack of like chips or a lot of butter on like a everything bagel, that is like a treat for me. And so I'm trying to just limit the sugary snacks, or if I do have a sugary snack, eating it with something else so I can metabolize it a little better. That's what I've wrote down. That's what I'm going for. Things that you make sure you got to eat in order to eliminate your cellulite are going to be micronutrients. The most important thing you can do is get your micronutrients. Forget not eating this or doing that. If you are bad at remembering rules around food, eat your micronutrients, then eat whatever the hell you want on top of that. I guarantee if you have all of your basics, your sodium, potassium, magnesium, your fats, your protein, your fiber, all of the little micronutrients, you won't want extra stuff and you'll be so satisfied and full that it'll be hard to overeat or indulge on something bad for you. Eating a lot of good collagen building foods and foods rich in omega-3 are also going to be really helpful. So flax seeds, lots of wild caught fish, um, maybe even supplementing with like a cod skin oil or cod liver oil, things that help skin and collagen. You can even just Google collagen rich foods or diet and start eating things on that list. Something that I love is a product from Organica. It is an enhanced collagen and electrolyte beverage mix. So one of the other points for reducing cellulite is drinking enough water, which is going to be on almost every list for how to become healthier and eliminate some kind of an issue, is drinking three liters of water. And one of the ways that you can do that if you're not a water lover and you don't like the taste of plain water, you're not satisfied by that, and you like something like a crystal light this Organica electrolyte collagen beverage, I am telling you guys, it tastes like candy. It's sweetened with a little bit of stevia, zero sugar, but it has bovine collagen in it. It also has magnesium and electrolytes, which like I was saying with micronutrients are really, really important. So yes, having three liters of water, but making sure that that water is not tap water. Probably the last switch I made and the most recent thing in our life is getting a tap put in up here of filtered water. We went with the under the counter AquaTrue system. There are whole home systems that you can buy. I think they're like thousands of dollars. We went with the option for the under the counter, which was I think $400. There's also like $100 options where you can just get a water pitcher that does a slow drip like a Brita or something that you can just leave in your fridge. Santa Via has a really great one. There are so many great water filters out there. So do some research into that. If you want a deep dive on water health and maybe good systems to look into, let me know because that's something I would love to talk about, but might also be a little dry, pun intended, even though it's opposite, <laughs> a little wet. <laughs> Anyways, drink your water, but make sure it's not tap water because why I say this, you guys, is if you look at the EWG, you can see what's in your tap water. And most cities, unfortunately, have shit tap water that is pumped with disgusting things. Literal waste, like remnants, diluted bits of pesticides, of human waste, of heavy metals, of fluoride. It is so bad and I and actually might be dehydrating you. If you find like you're really thirsty all of the time and you are drinking tap water, you might actually be depleting yourself of hydration. I drink a lot less water ever since we got this system installed. And ever since I, I've been using things like LMNT, which, or putting like a little salt in my water or using that Organica electrolyte, I don't drink as much water, but I feel more hydrated and like I'm not diluting all of my body's water. And while we're on the topic of beverages, something else that you want to do is limit your caffeine intake. I wasn't sure if this was because caffeine itself is bad for cellulite, 
but I imagine because it helps you retain water and that retaining water around the fat cells is a thing, it might not be the best idea there. But mostly a lot of the research I was finding around caffeine was to do with sleep and optimizing rest because a lot of us don't remember that caffeine has a half-life, which means that it stays in our system. I think it's six hours after we've consumed it. So even if you have your last cup of coffee at two or three, which feels early, you could be feeling it in your body still and having the effects of that elevated caffeine until like 9 p.m. So all of the rest that your body should be doing from like seven till nine is probably not really happening. So limiting that caffeine, making sure that you're drinking three liters of pure filtered water, ensuring that your carb intake is from single source ingredients, really limiting your sugar grams per day and making sure that you're pairing sugar with other things so that you're avoiding any kind of insulin spike, making sure that you are not on any kind of synthetic birth control, really upping your micronutrients and keeping an eye on that as a baseline and then eating whatever you want on top of that. And then I also have here some supplements that will both not only help prevent cellulite, but supplements that help eradicate and detox your body to eliminate cellulite. So you want to supplement with collagen, go to kala, ginkgo, omega-3s, and sweet red clover. These will be supportive for your body, things that are preventative and beautifying for your skin and your collagen and new cell turnover. Things that you want to supplement with in order to detox from toxins that are already in your body and help break things up and eliminate them are going to be activated charcoal, Irish sea moss, diatomaceous earth, which is fossils, you guys. Literally ground up fossils. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> I've just purchased some and am consuming it. And coriander seeds. Really, really cool. I had no idea. Coriander seeds not only help with cellulite, but they help flush your liver of toxins. So if you have any liver issues, if you have any kind of other toxic buildup, coriander seeds, either whole sprinkled in water and consumed or ground up and put into smoothies or on top of food or whatever you want, however you want to eat them, coriander seeds will help detox. So I am putting a lot of these powders in my smoothie. Like I was saying, my smoothie is not just fruit and sugar and juice anymore. It is a little bit of fruit, a lot of good fat, a lot of nice quality coconut milk. I'm putting in activated charcoal. I'm putting in diatomaceous earth. I'm putting in moringa powder, more for my greens and chlorophyll. Sometimes I'll put in that collagen supplement if I'm not drinking that separately. I'm also adding turmeric powder because I know that that is anti-inflammatory. Not so sure if it's detoxifying like the coriander seeds, but something I do want to pick up is coriander seeds and the Irish sea moss because those are two things I do not have. And I definitely want to add to my little regime to get the best results. So what else can we do outside of diet, outside of these things that I just mentioned, there are a lot of lifestyle things that we can do. The first one being managing stress, really getting control of our cortisol, that stress hormone, and making sure that we have recovery in the day, making sure that we are building our resilience. So having my aura ring and getting to track my resiliency score and really allow it to help me tune better into my rest, which I can really easily ignore the cues that my body gives me to just chill out sometimes. But that is something that I've got to do. It's something that I feel like I've finally achieved. I feel a lot more chilled out in the last year than I have in my whole life. And so we'll see how this new chilled out state of managed healthy cortisol ends up going with my cellulite. Another thing is optimizing sleep. So managing stress and optimizing sleep, two of the most important things that you can do. And then outside of that, if you want to really ramp it up, strength training and exercise, particularly weightlifting, doing things like RDLs, doing things like squats, doing lunges, Backward lunges are fantastic. Actually, reverse lunges help work the glutes and the back of the thighs the most, more than forward lunges. So all of these kind of heavy weightlifting activities that really target the glutes and legs will definitely help. 
as will rebounding. So something I've seen a ton of is the use of a mini trampoline or even just like bopping on your own heels or jumping in place or skipping. I've been trying to just incorporate more bouncing and jumping in my life because I do yoga and strength training, which is so slow and controlled. And I really try and have zero impact on my joints. But that means that I'm never really experiencing vibration in my body. And so rebounding and jumping is something that does help break things up. It moves your lymph around. And that is crazy important because movement is one of the only things that can have an impact on our fascia and our lymphatic system. A lot of people think that for lymphatic drainage, you have to, you have to go to someone and get a massage. You can also run and move and do yoga and stretch and pandiculate, as you've heard me talk about in previous episodes. Obviously, you can also go somewhere for a massage, but movement, you have to actually physically move your body in order to help release these built up physical symptoms, right? So adding a lot of that vibration, a little bit of bouncing, kind of a fun side story, and I can't wait to talk about it in a future episode. So I mentioned it a couple episodes ago, about leading by example and how I think it's really important to not force your family or your partner or your friends to get into healthy things that you are getting into and to allow them to naturally come to them out of curiosity because they see you doing it and they see you enjoying it or benefiting from it. And one of those things has happened in my life with Michael, which is strength training and working out together. Out of nowhere the other day, Mike woke me up and was like, I've got some exciting news we are going to have a home gym. (laughs) He was inspired to sell a couple of things in the garage and make space to purchase some gym equipment, like a squat rack and a squat bench and some plates and equipment so that we can actually strength train together in the garage. And (laughs) I am way more excited about that than I should be. I tried to like play it really cool with him. Like, oh yeah, that's cool. But I was super giddy. And he knows that I can't hide anything from him. (laughs) He sees right through it and I get so excited. So anyway, I have been a little yoga heavy lately, which is amazing. And it's so good for stress management and my nervous system health and really just calming me down. But I'm also now so excited to get back into weight training a little bit because I have fallen off over the last few weeks and I feel like Mike getting more into it. We're just going to be out there together listening to fun music and doing some squats and pull-ups. <laughs> so that should be fun. But it is very important, if I haven't noted this already, that you do not out-train your recoverability. So as important as exercise and strength training is for, for eliminating cellulite, one of the things that causes cellulite is stress and high cortisol. So you want to make sure that you're not doing high intensity and that if you are doing something high intensity, or if you are doing anything for that matter, that you're not doing more than you can recover from that day. You really have to make sure that your recoverability and your resilience and your bounce back is high. So if you're doing two hours of hardcore working out that you do not feel recovered from by the next day, that is too much. You want to really pare it back and don't go so hard. Do something a little bit gentler, maybe a little more consistently and make sure that you have enough time to rest so that when you wake up, you aren't suffering from the day before's activities. You want to be restored and feel balanced by those activities because you got enough rest as well. So outside of diet and lifestyle, the two hardest things to do What are some products we can use and what are some procedures we can do and what are some other things? Well, let's just get right into it. Studied and verified products are going to be caffeine creams. Super interesting. There's been a ton of research into caffeine for cellulite and I didn't look up why it helps break it up, but it simply does and it's been studied and verified. So there are tons of creams on the market And while you can purchase them, you can also make your own caffeine scrub. So I plan on experimenting with this DIY scrub first. And maybe in a few months, if I feel inclined, I'll I'll try a cream. But all you have to really do is combine coffee grounds, unground coffee grounds, like not used ones, fresh coffee grounds with coconut oil and use that as an exfoliant to massage and to massage and work into the areas on your body where you have cellulite. And this is a fantastic pre-ritual to do before something like dry brushing or gua sha massage or hand massage or cupping. 
So those things are more anecdotal. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence to support that massage works and helps break up fascia. We know this. We just don't have enough studies about it, but I can verify this for you as someone who's experienced it myself. Something else, once again, more anecdotal, cupping and using tools like stone massagers. There's various gua sha stones other than just the basic one that you see on the face. There are a lot of stones that you can purchase for the body that have ridges or teeth or a larger surface area that you can really work into your fascia. I've seen fascia blasters as well, and I do not have experience with those. Maybe I'll buy some as well. I'm willing to just try it all and see what works. I personally have a beautiful gua sha stone that has really big teeth. So I'm using that as well as my Theragun, as well as my hands. Honestly, anytime I'm out in the sun, anytime I'm watching TV in the afternoon or evening, I am just trying to remember to loosen up the fascia on my legs and do a lot of skin rolling. So I am pinching the skin on my thighs and trying to lift it off of the muscle. And it is really stiff and sticky, you guys. For me, it is so easy to pinch the skin on my arms, on my chest, everywhere I don't have cellulite. In the areas I have cellulite, the skin seems so thick and gluey and stuck, and it really actually hurts. Like it almost feels like I'm bruising myself by simply pinching the skin to try and lift it off. And so I'm just working on trying to loosen all of that. Like I said, mostly with my hands, sometimes with my Theragun, sometimes with my massage stone. And also speaking loving words to it. I know that there is something to affirmation and self-talk and our spoken word. So while I'm doing these massages, you guys, I don't find it funny or weird to just be thinking in my head or saying out loud, I am breaking up my cellulite. My legs are restoring. I am healing my fascia and doing good for my body. And as a final product note before I go into some other techniques, Another thing that has been studied, not to eliminate cellulite, but to reduce its appearance is retinol creams, specifically for cellulite, not retinol that you would purchase for your face. And why is because it thickens your skin. So although it may not eliminate your cellulite, it's thickening the skin on top of it and helping tighten it. So if you have loose skin, if you have any crepiness, a retinol cream might actually be really good to help tighten the skin and thicken it so that you see the bumps a little bit less and it's a little less noticeable, but not something that eliminates it. If you're looking to eliminate it, there are some procedures that you can do. I am going to try everything else first. I'm going to go the holistic route as I always do, but I wanted to provide you guys with some options if you wanted to go the medical route or go to an aesthetics office for a treatment. One of them is cellulase, which is a laser treatment. That is definitely the most invasive. So I would stick to that last, or if you're totally fed up or you need immediate results, maybe something to look into. And then two other therapies that I thought were so cool was acoustic sound wave therapy and radio frequency therapy, which both deal with vibrations, with frequency. And if you know me, you know how much of a nerd I am about sound and frequency work and the fact that all of our cells in our body and every living thing has a frequency associated with it. So I went on my own little tirade because I have a extensive list of healing frequencies. It's like 20 pages long and I searched through it for cellulite and nothing came up. So I then searched through it for fascial restriction or fascia dysfunction and 20 Hertz came up for helping break up any kind of adhesions and fascial restrictions. So kind of cool to think that maybe while you're doing your massage or any of this work or making your smoothie with diatomaceous earth, you are putting on 20 hertz frequency to help heal fascia. Then what I found interesting was after learning about that 20 hertz, I was Googling what is the frequency that these acoustic sound therapy devices use, that these radio frequency wands use on these patients. And they were also in that frequency. Some of these wands on the medical site said they were anywhere from 20 to 36 hertz. Other wands were around 50 hertz. And basically, I looked at three or four different sites, and they were all anywhere from 20 to 50 hertz. 
speaking about those frequencies specifically being ones that really target and help break up the fluid and inflammation and help release the toxins from the cell. So really interesting, maybe something to look into on the DIY side of things and trying to just YouTube different frequencies or downloading a tone generator so that you can do a binaural beat of like a 20 hertz and a 50 hertz. Uh, it may not sound very pleasant, but hey, beat spending thousands of dollars potentially. Or you could just go that route if you're a nice, beautiful high roller. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, and I feel like this was already mentioned in some of the other ones, but massage, simply lymphatic drainage practices, doing your rebounding, doing lymphatic drainage, the big six routine that I've talked about before on the podcast, the swiping of the collarbones, the neck, the armpits, the draining of the belly and the groin and behind the knees. So making sure that your lymphatic health is tip top shape. Breath work is a great technique for lymphatic health. Yoga is fantastic as well. Movement of any kind is going to be beneficial and massage when all else fails. If you can't work out, if you've even gone a month without doing any kind of physical activity other than like walking or something, if you are couch or bed bound, at least be massaging yourself and forcing the physical movement in your body and in your system that way manually, if you can't be out physically moving about. And that my friends is it. That is the regime. Those are the things that you can do to lower or eliminate the cellulite, particularly on your thighs and butt. And this is the exact regime, the diet and the lifestyle and some of the massage techniques that I plan on using over the next five months. So if you are curious about following along with my journey and my progress, make sure that you are following and subscribe to the podcast and make sure that you're following me on Instagram at Sabrina Smelko, because I'm going to be sharing a little bit more intimately there with photos and videos and a lot more updates and stories as the next five months go on. I'll probably just pop on there every once in a while and share a little insight or a little photo of how my dimples are looking. <laughs> and yeah, I hope this helped you guys. I hope this was interesting for you guys. As always, if you have any questions or comments or ideas or topics in mind for future episodes, please let me know by either commenting on my latest Instagram post or sending me a DM or an email. I am so excited to get into this journey and to be doing this alongside you guys and just sharing without shame. Honestly, for a minute there, I questioned doing this episode. I questioned sharing any photos or video of my cellulite. This morning, I shared on Instagram some pretty candid, like squeezing my butt, dimple butt moments just to show you guys that this is what my body looks like and it's okay but it's also okay to want to change it for the better. Because here's the thing, we are changing. I think in society, we can be like, no, you don't have to change yourself, it's fine. And we tend to normalize a lot of things. But I think sometimes a lot of the things that we are normalizing, being depressed or feeling like crap or having your hair fall out or bad posture as you get older, isn't okay. I think that's the wrong message to send. I would rather us normalize feeling good as we age. How nice would it be to normalize being active and fit in our 70s? How exciting would it be to normalize that women get more beautiful as they get older? You know, like these are the things that I think about. These are the things that get me excited. These are the things that I'm curious about. And as I've learned, if I am thinking about this, there's probably other people thinking about this too. And so, that's why I am sharing this with you guys, because there's no use in shame or fear. There is only use for curiosity and being open and learning and being myself. And you know what, guys? Myself has cellulite. And myself also recognizes that that might be a symptom of dysfunction. And so myself wants to listen to that and change myself for the better out of honoring and being devoted to the fact that my body is living and alive and part of nature. And so I think that's where I'm going to leave this episode. As always, I am so grateful for your listenership. It means the world to me. Until we speak again, my friends, you guys take care. Adios. Let me know what you thought of this episode of Every 7 Years over on my Instagram at Sabrina Smelko, S-M-E-L-K-O. And if you did enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rating or review. It's the best way to support a new podcast like mine.
Until our paths cross again, take care.